So we're going to begin our afternoon session, well, second afternoon session, uh, with a presentation by a longtime collaborator of ours, uh, Dr. Thomas Quinn from the University of Washington, who will be taking us through some of the latest evolutions in uh, the N-body gravity program called Changa. Um, thank you, Tom. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, all right. So I am going to be talking about computational cosmology, second computational cosmology uh, talk of the, of, of the day. Uh, but I'm going to focus on scaling these uh, n-body and smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations in the context of late redshift small scale. And I don't know if you remember the picture that uh, Mike showed you. As you go to smaller and smaller scales in cosmology, the uh, mass distribution becomes more and more clustered and therefore a greater computational challenge. Uh, I need to point out that there's a cast of thousands that have worked on, uh, on Changa over the years, both at University of Washington uh, and here at uh, Illinois, and I, I, I neglected to mention people in between, uh, Tim Haynes and others have uh, contributed, uh, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for their uh, contributions. Uh, let me start by reviewing what we're trying to do with computational cosmology. Uh, and uh, right, we start at the very, not quite the very beginning, but the remarkable thing about cosmology is that we actually know what our initial conditions are. We have this accurate map of the universe as it was when it was only 380,000 years old given to us from the microwave sky. And this is a map of the microwave sky from the Planck satellite. The color variations are variations in the temperature of the sky, uh, a few parts in 10 to the 5, so very minute variations. But we know the physics of these variations. They come from acoustic waves in the, in the early universe. And so we, they give us a direct measure of, well, of the physics going on in the early universe. And what happens from then on is that the self-gravity of these small perturbations uh, amplifies uh, the perturbations until they become uh, <clears throat> uh, large overdensities, make what we call galaxies. And we can see, if we look at a map of the galaxies, you see that there are these uh, bubble-like structures, and those directly map back to those temperature fluctuations that you saw in the previous map. But the real complication comes in that these, right, the, the galaxies are individual points here, uh, but galaxies aren't individual points, right? So in this uh, remarkable simulation, uh, you can see that the, the galaxy is uh, composed of stars. Uh, star forming regions are what the pink is. There's dust, which are the, the dark regions. And the, so there's a lot of hydrodynamics that is going on uh, that we need to model if we're going to produce galaxies look, that look like the ones we see in the sky. And not only that, there's variety, right? This is a galaxy that sort of looks like our own Milky Way. Uh, and 51, there's galaxies that look like this. Uh, this is uh, M87. Uh, and not so much uh, gas and dust here, at least not visible. But there's this little uh, uh, thing coming out here. It's a jet. And it's an evidence, not the only evidence, that there's a supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy. And presumably, that black hole has something to do with the, uh, with the structure of the galaxy. And we need to model that as well. So over the years, we've uh, developed a code we call Changa. Uh, and uh, right, the main point, that the reason I'm here, is that it's a massively parallel smooth particle hydrodynamics code. But we've also uh, implemented a number of physics features uh, that is, uh, well, uh, such as the supernova feedback. Mike showed you pictures of that. Uh, uh, modeling where the stars form based on the state of the gas. Uh, SMBH is supermassive black hole. So these large 
but black holes that we uh, infer are in the centers of galaxies, including our own Milky Way, uh, and optimizing all these parameters to produce realistic galaxies. And also, uh, like Mike, we are in a code comparison project where we're trying to verify among all the cosmological simulators that the physics we are um, reproducibly introducing the physics into our code. So I uh, got to show a movie. Uh, give me a second to get it up here. So. Here we're in physical coordinates. So what you're seeing is the initial expansion of the universe. The blue is coal gas. It will turn red as it heats up. Uh, Mike talked about uh, early star formation. We believe that the conditions in the very early universe were such that large clouds of gas could directly collapse into what would be the seeds of our supermassive black holes. And those are those white dots that you see. We follow the dynamics and the merging of those black holes as they fall to the center of the galaxies. So uh, black holes, as they eat the gas, they're very messy eaters, so that a significant fraction of the ener uh, gravitational energy of the, of the uh, consumed gas gets uh, pushed back into the surrounding uh, uh, galactic gas and produces those uh, blasts that you see here. Uh, furthermore, as you have uh, mergers between uh, 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 subgalaxies, that triggers the inflow of gas into the center of the galaxy, feeds the black hole, and gives you this, this, this phenomenal outflow. And, we, and so why do we model all this? Well, we're trying to explain a very funny thing. So the plot here I have is, on the bottom axis, is the mass of a halo. Uh, 10 to the 12 solar masses is about where our own Milky Way is. And the vertical axis is the fraction of mass that's in stars. And so it's a very funny thing. Uh, the Milky Way is actually quite efficient at turning its gas into stars. As we go to lower masses, it becomes more inef inefficient. We think we understand that because of the supernova feedback. What's a little harder to explain is why do things become inefficient as you go to higher mass? And our, our hypothesis uh, is that it's those supermassive black holes that are uh, regulating star formation at those higher masses. And the uh, remarkable result is that a simulation we ran on, on blue waters, uh, 25 megaparsec volume, if we go in and take, grab a sample of the galaxies, those are the blue points, uh, we actually match up quite well with um, a couple of the observations. It's actually a little hard to, to observe what the stellar fraction is here, so that's the difference between the two uh, solid lines, different observers. So uh, we're quite p pleased with uh, our results so far, but again, it's uh, getting these results out is predicated on getting our simulations to scale efficiently, efficiently in the presence of highly clustered uh, uh, computational load. A quick review of how we do this the, for uh, the chars that we're using uh, in Changa are these tree pieces, which are essentially a vertical slice of the tree all the way up to the root. Uh, down here, we have nodes that are internal to the tree piece. Uh, but as we go up the, up the tree, we get these orange nodes that are actually shared between uh, tree pieces. So everybody does have a copy of, of the root node. Uh, and then, there are, of course, there are the yellow ones are uh, pointers to off, off tree piece nodes, uh, possibly off processor. In the charm fashion, we distribute these uh, tree pieces across the, our machine with multiple tree pieces on a physical processor. But furthermore, within a tree piece, we divide up the work into subunits. We have local work, which only depends on the data that's on the tree piece. 
And that, but then we, we also have global work where we're looking for gravitational forces uh, on, from uh, other uh, tree pieces. And of course, this involves communication to other processors. Uh, we cache, the, uh, when we ask for data from another processor, we cache it. Uh, but while all this is going on, we can fill in the communication with this local work. So, uh, and, and likewise, that was for the gravity, the smooth particle hydrodynamics is yet another separate task that we can schedule concurrently. So, uh, this is uh, from my Opening slide, again, this is 25 megaparsecs across, a snapshot of the dark matter distribution at the present time. This particular simulation uh, used 24 billion particles, but the clustering is such that this object up here has half a billion of those 24 billion particles in, 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 a, in a sphere that's less than a megaparsec uh, in radius. And to put this to physical scale, this is about 10 Milky Ways worth of matter here. So I, not even really a cluster, a small group is what it is. Um, so, the, so can we scale this? And, and uh, the answer is yes. So this is, again, this is a 25 megaparsec, slightly smaller uh, simulation, but just as clustered and we have the scaling, uh, 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 strong scaling plot on blue waters, in this case going out to 100,000 processors with a remarkable 80% uh, parallel efficiency. Uh, so that's uh, terrific, but I want to do even harder problems. The problem I'm wor working on now is clusters of galaxies. And now I'll have a similar amount of mass as that 25 megaparsec volume, but it's all concentrated in roughly one cluster and then the surrounding uh, cosmology. How are we going to do that? Uh, we, the challenges that we have to overcome, there's the load imbalance. There is also communication imbalance, which has been talked about uh, several times today. A particular problem in, cause in what I'm doing is that there's several phases of the calculation I have to do. I have to do a gravity calculation. That has one load pattern. I have to do a hydrodynamics calculation. That has a different load pattern. I have to do star formation. That has a completely different load pattern. And then the supermassive black hole physics has yet another uh, pattern of load, and I have to switch between these phases uh, as, I, uh, as I do my calculation. And furthermore, I'm doing this, uh, the, these calculations both for all particles at once, a large time step, and sometimes I only need to calculate the force for a subset of the particles on a small time step, similar to what uh, uh, Michael talked about. And of course, with each of these steps, there are these fixed costs. In order to do any of these calculations, I'm going to have to distribute my load across the processors, balance it, and build a tree in to, to do both the, the gravity calculation and the neighbor finding that I need to do for smooth particle hydrodynamics. <clears throat> so here's an example of the kind of simulation I'm working on. Um, this is a rather crude representation, but I wanted to show all the dark matter. This is roughly a, uh, so this is a 10 to the 14 solar mass cluster in the middle of a simulation, and, and I had this variable resolution. Most of my resolution elements are around the cluster. The full simulation itself is, well, in volume is eight times this. In, in distance, it's uh, twice this. So I, the, I'm zoomed into the center part of this simulation, and it shows where, uh, where my particles are. Just a little science background. Why am I doing clusters? Well, these are the largest uh, bound objects in the universe. Uh, due to particular observational effects, we can see them uh, uh, across uh, the universe. Uh, they are very useful in understanding the expan expansion of the universe, the dark energy. Um, and these are probably the places where 
the uh, supermassive black holes, uh, uh, most supermassive black holes end up. <clears throat> so that's the kind of simulation. Here's the challenge. Let me put up another picture of this same simulation, but I've changed two things. One, I'm not plotting particles here, I'm plotting tree pieces. So each point on this uh, plot represents roughly 1,000 particles. So uh, part of my uh, one char, uh, which I'm doing my, uh, uh, my uh, virtual domain decomposition. And then the coloring is scaled according to the computational cost, as, as measured by the charm runtime system. And the color scale roughly covers an order of magnitude. That is, per particle, it costs 10 times as much to calculate gravity at the center of this cluster as it does in the, in the outskirts. So that, that's, the, um, that's the real challenge here. Uh, so uh, how do we tackle it? Well, we came up with a different load balancer than you've uh, seen before. This is a different simulation just for illustration. It's, uh, basically orthogonal recursive bisection load balancing, where I balance the load according, by making uh, uh, divisions in a binary tree. So divisions in a uh, binary tree is to dis uh, distribute the load. The reason I'm putting it in a tree structure is this is basically a poor man's way of taking care of communication. That is, rather than instrumenting communication, I, I already know that if I'm here, I'm going to be communicating with stuff over here, and so I, I make sure that my load balancer maintains the spatial information of where the tree pieces are. So this is uh, ORB load balancing. So what if we apply this load balancing to that cluster, just assuming that each particle has the same computational weight? Here's what the uh, load balance uh, looks like. Uh, those of you familiar with projections know what this is. So here's a timeline, uh, a computational timeline, uh, 30 seconds on the horizontal axis, and then machine utilization uh, going from 0 to 100%. Uh, white is bad in, in this kind of plot. Uh, and, but the coloring, non-white coloring, is showing what pieces of the computation are being executed. And so you can see, for example, at the beginning of a step, there's significant amounts of communication, but that is being overlapped by, uh, yeah, the blue is local gravity work. So there's computation, communication overlap. The green here is, uh, there's three stages to the, uh, the hydro. This is calculating basically the mass conservation equation, momentum equation, and then the energy equation is the slice here. And you notice how uh, charm plus plus is overlapping all these stages. And then once the communication is done, this dark blue is the remote uh, gravity calculation. So there's nice overlap between all the communications, except for the fact that some nodes are, have significantly more computation to do. Uh, even, so people mentioned CK loop. So the orange here is the attempt to load balance on a node by using idle on-node processors. Helps some, but there's a significant, um, uh, well, significant uh, lack of load balance. So, Okay, so, but we do have, we do have charm, we can measure the loads, and so what, what happens if we load balance by, uh, by the actual compute time, and we see we do a lot better. I, I've kept the horizontal axis the same, okay, so, just so you can make a comparison, and you can see, well, first of all, it's kind of obvious that the, the amount, uh, the uh, idle time due to lack of load balance has gone down significantly, uh, that's terrific. Uh, this white space is just I.O., so ignore that. Uh, the white space not to ignore is over here. So this gap here is the, the load balancer. There's two stages. One, that's the strategy. 
and you see there's communication going on here, that's the shuffling time. So there, there's, yes, there's some time for the load balance, but that is small compared to the amount of time you made up by doing a better job of, of load balancing. You also see here uh, an issue with the phases. Okay, so here's a star formation phase with its load balancing uh, here. Uh, it's done nicely, uh, not much load imbalance, and particularly since it only lasts for uh, uh, less than a second. But then right away, I've got to shuffle everything around to, to uh, do a good job uh, balancing the gravity slash uh, hydrodynamics work. So ORB. this is, yeah, both of them are ORB. Uh, and it's sort of, uh, um, I should mention, this is also the multi-phase. So we in, independently uh, uh, in, um, measure the star formation phase independent of the gravity phase so that we know so when we go here, we use the data from the last star formation phase. And from here, we use the data from the last, actually, large uh, uh, gravity phase. And speaking of large gravity phase, right, a real issue in load balancing is this large phase versus small phase. So, um, uh, so here are two large phases, which are load balanced nicely. Uh, there's star formation again. And then there's, uh, sorry, now I forget, roughly 16 small time steps in between. And clearly, there's a lot of idle time because, because there's not a whole lot of work to be done, but it, but it needs to be done. So there's a, a, um, it's difficult uh, to, to load balance that properly. When you're only, right, we're only, uh, again, talking, uh, well, less than a second per, per small step. You blow that up, and you can see that these small rungs dominate. Um, again, the resolution, right, so that, right, this whole thing is only going from about 12 seconds long, so each of these steps is less than a second. Uh, so one of the biggest uh, time consumers, this is solving the thermal energy equation, which, can, uh, which is actually quite a stiff equation to solve. Um, and so this, right, here is the challenge, getting all these things to load balance out. And if you blow it up again, so here's the total interval of one second. Uh, and what do we have to do in this second? We have to move the particles. We have to give them, uh, there's a sorting operation. We've got to get them in tree order, which means assigning them a, uh, a key, which re represents their place in a key, shuffling them among, this is essentially uh, uh, shuffling the particles among the domains, actually doing the sort on the domain, and then, uh, then the last step, build the tree is that spike. And here's calculating gravity and SPH. Tiny fraction of all the works involved. And, and so this, right, uh, on the big step, we focus on this. And it's clear that we should be paying more attention to this. And we haven't so far. Uh, and again, this is taken directly from Blue Water's run uh, of, of, the, of a large Virgo size cluster. So there's, there's work to be done here. Uh, and furthermore, it'd be even better if we could remove some of these barriers. Uh, so understanding the data dependencies between the phases is still more work to be done. Okay, so just to summarize that, um, um, low balance, uh, big steps, done nicely. Uh, I should point out, despite all the problems, there's work to be done, but even if they're not optimal, they certainly increase the, th the throughput of the simulation, which for me, that, that's what's important, getting, getting the science done. But we do have room for improvement. Uh, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about what we're doing on the GPU. Uh, 
The key thing is to, to note here that we're only doing the gravity work on the GPU. The, the CPUs actually walk the tree and send interactions for the GPU to calculate. All right, uh, just uh, a, way, uh, a way to divide work. Um, nevertheless, if we look at a, an SPH, so that in this case we're doing hydrodynamics. This is actually a protoplanetary disk, which actually, relative to cosmology, the hydrodynamics is more expensive. A busy plot, but this is a strong scaling plot on PISDAINT. A uh, number of CPU cores here and uh, the gravity plus SPH time, and the choice is whether we include the GPU that's on every node or not. And I want you to compare uh, CPU only SPH, which is the red line, with the, the large purple line, and notice that how we've been successful in scaling in gravity plus SPH, even though it's only the gravity being done on the GPU. Uh, but an important part of getting that done is uh, notice this light blue line where we had the GPU, but we did not have the SMP implementation. All right, so it turns out the SMP really helps the SPH uh, performance, and only, we only got good scaling for the, for the combined with SMP on the node and the GPU. Um, there's more work being done. Uh, this is work by Jean-Claude Liu at P Purdue University. who points out that actually there's a way to do the tree walk on the GPU, um, which is uh, essentially by lockstepping all the uh, tree descents so that all threads in a warp are synchronized. But that's uh, pretty tricky work. And so I, I want to finish up by sort of uh, advertising it for what we're trying to do. We'd like to try, uh, hide all that nasty GPU tree traversal trickery underneath a, uh, a, an abstraction layer so that a programmer, for example, somebody doing gravity or SPH, could just call, say, a neighbor finding algorithm and have that operate on a variety of hardware, including the GPU, massively parallel machines, multi-core machines. Uh, and that's uh, this uh, 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 project we're calling Paratreat in order to abstract all, all the things we've learned about parallel algorithms on both GPUs and massively parallel machines. So uh, with that, uh, I'll point out that uh, Changa is available. There are uh, people, I mean, probably uh, people who have independently modified this code uh, in particular, uh, somebody has downloaded this code and modified it to do uh, moving mesh hydrodynamics, completely independent uh, of the work I'm doing. So that's, uh, I'm really pleased with that work by Phil Chang. Uh, um, so feel free to steal from it yourself. Right? And finally, let me just thank uh, uh, the, the funding agencies, and of course, ultimately the taxpayers, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Tom. Questions? Uh, uh, first, a uh, simple question. So what is a particle in your simulation? Is that, are there like real particles, like atoms or stars? What? I should have made that clear. Uh, so the particles are actually samples of the mass distribution. Uh, uh, I think one way to think of these simulations is that the, you're, you're, you're Monte Carlo sampling the mass distribution with these particles. So their, 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 their actual mass is you know, up to a million solar masses. Okay. Uh, second question, uh, there are like dense parts of uh, the dark matter on some of your figures. And are they, are they like observable from experiments? Like in general, are there any way to like, like experimental observation for those uh, data you have simulated? Well, I, all right, so not to be too funny, but the main characteristic of dark matter is that it's dark. And, and that, yeah, but, you know, so it's hard to <laughs> observe. Um, so we actually don't know what 
other physics dark matter contains, uh, if it can self-annihilate, then we might be able to detect it by looking at gamma ray production in the centers of, of galaxies. Uh, if it interacts with uh, normal matter somehow, we could build detectors on Earth. And so there's a number of direct detection experiments uh, around the globe. We're trying to detect the dark matter that's streaming through the Earth. Okay. Uh, another quick question. So you have a uh, different load balancing for different phases. And uh, looking at the wrong time map, I think you do it like sort of take turns. So you d do a star formation and then you do gravity. Mm -hmm. And how do, you uh, how do you decide the like the time step sizes for for these? And do, do, you, do you split up into like really tiny uh, time steps, which is going to make the transition? many times or right. how, well, how do you I think that was part step? of the one slide. They, so some of these time steps are less than a second. Okay. Yeah, so there's many small time steps, right, which makes it difficult. Okay. Hey, Tam? So the GPU uh, plus SMP with SPH, uh, the, the purple line that you had on there mm -hmm. on, your, on your plot, so by adding SPH to the GPU, you were slower than the GPU with just gravity, uh, but the SPH is being done in parallel with the gravity work on the GPU, is that? Yes, the SPH is done, being done in parallel, but it, it, I mean, it adds work. Because remember, the CPU is also doing the, the tree walking for the gravity. Yeah, but it seems, I mean, the, the tree walk is a pr pretty small time. Um, yeah. I'm just surprised that it was that much different. Well, well, first of all, I mean, it's protoplanetary disk, so it's a, well. Oh, that's right. This is the protoplanetary disk. Uh, yeah, that's so, right. that's so right. the relative amount of CPU time for gravity is relatively small. Yeah. yeah you yeah. don't have periodic boundary conditions. It's a two-dimensional, mostly two-dimensional distribution both of which makes gravity uh, a little faster. So I'm going to touch about this in my talk, um, the one after Michael's in a bit, but just very briefly, in terms of the GPU performance for Changa, do you have any idea of how much um, performance cost you're getting due to load imbalance on the GPU specifically and not on the CPU? Um. Right, so load balancing the GPU has, uh, it's still in nascent stages. We're, we're really just getting the infrastructure there to load balance the GPU. Uh, let's see if I have, right, so if you look down at this, all right, the gravity plot. So this lower green line is gravity only on the, on the GPU. And you can see the flattening out here. I am almost certain that this flattening is due to load imbalance. OK. Gotcha. Uh, which we're able to handle. Notice we can take the CPU out to higher core count, higher node count. So you showed the plot where you did the uh, small time stepping, and you had a fair amount of imbalance there. You didn't really tell us how you're doing the integration there, but I was wondering, could you do uh, a higher order integration method to collapse many of these time steps into a single step? Higher order. I, let me think about that. Um, we, we use a particular integration method that, um, called LeapFrog uh, that has good energy conserving uh, properties. Uh, I'm not sure if, it, if going to higher order will make things better or worse. Um, uh, you could still construct uh, higher order symplectic integrators. Yeah, so would... by, I mean, it will lay, allow us to take larger time steps, hopefully. Um, well, I, I haven't oh, thought, offline. yeah. No question, I just wanted to make a comment. Thomas was stunning. I want to be you when I grow up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's thank our speaker again. All right, thank you.